My name is Harold Vaughn, and I'm privileged to be here today with my friends and mentors, Ralph and Lou Cetera from the Canadian Revival Fellowship. They have been a tremendous uh, inspiration and help to us, and we're here today to talk about pretty much the Canadian Revival. So, Ralph and Lou, give us a little introduction. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. You kind of look alike. Uh, yes, we look alike. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm the younger of the two, born 10 minutes after he was born. See, I got him off to a good start. I gave him a push and got him off to a good start. I've been pushing him ever since. <laughs> when I was born, my dad said, what a wonderful son. And then he came along, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> what, right, but, what year were you guys born? Um, I, Lou, can you remember what year we were born? Nin 1932. Wow. See, it's bad when you forget your twin brother's birthday, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us no. a little bit about your 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 personal backgrounds uh, before you got into revival ministry. Uh, for 18 years, we actually traveled as evangelists, having evangelistic crusades for a week at a time in different churches. And it was wonderful. We saw a number of people really find the Lord. And it was a thrilling experience indeed. But after a number of years like that, something began to bother us about why is it we could go back to some of those places and wonder where are those people we prayed with? What happened to them? And there are some that were there, but many others were not there. We wondered what happened. And God began to deal with us about the fact Maybe, maybe our message was wrong. Or maybe um, the pastoral leadership in the church is not what it ought to be. Or maybe the uh, congregation is such that it's not conducive to the growth of new believers. And I began to evaluate that, and I think maybe all three were true. The message was not complete. Pastors were, may not have been understanding how to lead people on and the, maybe their message was not complete. And of course, if there's not a genuine revival in the church, then the church is not ready. See, and we, we began to see that in some cases, a new believer would first have to backslide in order to feel at home with the rest of the Christians. There, you, Vance Havner years ago, told the story of what it was like when he went to a church and, and he was preaching and there was a new believer just found the Lord sitting on the front row. And Vance Havner, while he was preaching, he was actually praying, dear Lord, dear Lord, don't let that new believer turn around. Do you know why? Because he would see two or three or four empty rows and then the rest of the people are way back there. And here's this new believer. See, and you see, and, and those people back there, they're saying, isn't it great to see that new believer sitting up there in the front row, so excited, so excited. And some say, yeah, that's the way we were when we got saved. But you see, now they're backslid. And so we began to see that all three of those needed to be corrected. And that's a whole nother story about how the correction came about. Lou? In other words, in other words they'll, they'll get back with us. They'll be sitting back here with us a little yes. bit. We had a man who was a tremendous uh, soul winner and then a discipler. His whole view was to disciple people into the Lord. And you know what, Harold? He would not even take the new convert into the church. He didn't want the person to come for at least seven or eight weeks before he had that kind of time mm -hmm. to disciple that person and prepare him for what he might feel when he gets around the church. So that kind of thing. But you Actually, know, let, let, let me add to that. He would say he, he wanted to prepare them for the shock yes. they would get by going into church and seeing not what they should be seeing, more deadness rather than life. Right. Yes, mm. but then you were saying about the preaching could be incomplete, and that's what God really dealt with us on the situation. We, we came out of university with the desire to win people for the Lord and so forth. And so what we would come for a week of revival when we had a week revival. So what we do the first few days, we have to, we have to almost shame the people. Why you're not bringing any unsaved people here to us to hear the gospel. So we'd have to sort of put them on a uh, guilt trip, go on out and get somebody for us to preach to. And so they, they 
pick it up a little bit, and by the end of the week, we have a few people uh, that we could see God save, and they would get saved, and the church would be happy. Uh, we got a few people saved. But that's where God dealt with us severely about the message that needs to be preached. Instead of shaming those people, deal with the heart and need of those people to where when a new person comes in and gets saved, he will get saved in an environment that says Christianity is far more than just an empty profession that I sort of casually accept Jesus and I put a one-way ticket in the back pocket and I'm on my way to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? And I go out and live my life as any way I want. Mm. But it's, when they get saved in the environment where they see God becoming real to God's people, mm. they say, I want to be in on that. There's more to it mm -hmm. than just a little decision. Actually, Lou, uh, that message that you're talking about, I, I called it Western-styled capitalistic Christianity. Oh, the you kind stole of preaching. That. You stole that title. I mean, I did. And then you See? picked it up. Okay. Um, See, we're uh, twins. That's why. I don't want you to go to heaven with something that I don't have. <laughs> well, let's, let's now, now, let me just talk okay. about that a minute. What is Western-style capitalistic Christianity? It's come and get all you can and can all you get and sit on the lid. See? Yeah. And that's it. What's, What's in, in it for me? me? What's in it for me? It's self in another form. Yes. What will make me better yes. rather than understanding the true message of self crucified at the cross. And that, that came into sharp focus yes. later. And God had to deal with us about that. And uh, instead of just going after the unsaved person to believe God for the move of God amongst God's people. So God had worked in your hearts concerning the methods and message. Tell us a little a backdrop about uh, Ebenezer Baptist Church in Saskatoon, Pastor Bill McLeod. Give us a little, uh, a little uh, insight into what was going on in the church before you came uh -huh. and saw the revival. Uh -huh. Well, and, uh, economically, the city of Saskatoon and that whole area was a depressed area. And so sometimes God uses that to cause people to recognize that they need more than what they can produce themselves. So that was even part of God's doing. And then God laid it on Bill McLeod's heart to pray. And he was the pastor of the Ebenezer Church. And for many years, for several years, he would be on his face before God, putting aside a lot of his pastoral duties in the mornings and just meeting God over the need for a genuine revival, mm -hmm. as well as meeting with the pastors in the city mm -hmm. for about four or five years before God saw fit to work in a most unusual way. And one of those pastors that was involved with that was Dr. Henry Blackaby. And he would tell how the, the tremendous blessing of meeting with those pastors and how it stimulated him and it encouraged him to believe that God had something more for the people, and that was all a part of the preparation for our coming in 1971. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we think of 1971, uh, then what happened is God prepared us uh, with the people of Canada in, a, in an unusual way, that we were 15 years preaching, Harold, I don't know if you're aware, 15 years preaching in Canada before the revival. And God gave us credibility with the Canadian people because of, the, you know, the reserve of the British way of life and the Canadian way of life. And God gave us favor with the Canadian people for 15 years that when God wanted to breathe on that city, God used us to be a little part of that. I'll mention that in just a little bit. Uh, there was credibility mm -hmm. and these weren't just some... Uh, folks who just moved in here and pulled off their deal, and here we got this thing, and maybe it's emotionalism, but God gave us credibility. That's God's sovereignty in his working. Let me add to that. Yeah. When I uh, fell in love with a young lady in Saskatoon yeah. that I married, uh, but the courtship was such that um, uh, with a couple in Winnipeg who opened their home when I would be able to visit there, but that couple, was called on by their pastor in Winnipeg to come to one of our crusades. And they were to spy on us 
to see and listen to this, whether or not we were just like American evangelists. Oh, what did that mean? Well, you see, because they were, the, the thinking of many Canadians was that Americans were flash in the pan, a lot of fanfare, a lot of uh, um, expression outwardly, but you wonder what, how real it is. And so they came to our meetings and then went back to the pastor and guess what they said to the pastor? They said, pastor, they're safe. They're not like American evangelists. And you see, what was that? God was using the rapport that he was giving us with the Canadian people to see that we were just ordinary people just, uh, just uh, wanting to love God and, and love people and share with them and not afraid to be close to them and minister to them in a very, very real way. Mm. And God used that mm. to spread the word mm. so that other pastors were interested in our coming. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Let's, uh, let's hop in right here. And I know our hearers want to hear about the Canadian revival. Mm -hmm. What an incredible, fantastic unbelievable move of God. I mean, so many hundreds of thousands of people were impacted mm -hmm. by this. So let's go back to the beginning of the uh, uh, church in, in uh, Saskatoon, Ebenezer Baptist. Talk about when you came in, and I think you had a break on Tuesday night yes. with two brothers. Kind of just, you all just okay. take it and run with it and all talk right. about it. Okay, so basically on October 13th, um, 1971, we started at the Ebenezer Baptist Church. And the first night of the meetings, nothing happened. And some of the people were discouraged, said, oh yeah, here we go. Another set of meetings like we've had in the past where nothing much happens. But on the second night, Irma Dirksen was the lady that God really powerfully impacted. She had been praying for revival for Canada. She was praying for the city, for the province, and for the country. Mm. And she wondered why no revival coming. And on the second night, God dealt with her about Irma. Why is it you're praying for revival for Canada and for the city when you can't even stand people in your own church, you can't including even... your, your pastor's wife? Oh, yeah. Okay, you got there. Yeah, and said, and, and so, God dealt with her about that, yes. and that's where it started. And she made it right with the pastor's wife and some of the people in the church. And that opened the way for her husband, who used to sing in the church with his own brother, physical brother. Not only in the church, Ralph, but and, uh, he sang in churches all over the place. He was well together. known, those two brothers. Yes, that's right. And they had a discord for two years. They had not spoken to each other. Yeah. And during the, that week, that fir the first few days, there in the basement of that church, how God dealt with him. Bill McLeod was there. And how one was, one, the, the one brother, when he was going, when this one was going to the other one to ask him for forgiveness. And the other one says, well, it's about time you did that. It's about time. Yeah. And they stayed all night until God broke his heart. About three or four o'clock yes. in the morning. <laughs> yes. And that was the beginning of it. And all at once, the word began to spread around the community. Ralph, uh, I think to even put this in context, God in his sovereignty had it arranged that in the first few days that we were going to hold meetings at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, that the church was going to, spot, was going to host the pastor's conference for the whole province of Saskatchewan. And all the pastors were coming in, and the idea was for the for us to have sessions in the morning with the pastors, and then at night they would come and be in the revival meeting. So they came, and God did this on the first nights yeah. of that crusade, and these pastors, God touched them. They had the privilege of seeing and feeling the power of God working like this. Mm -hmm. Guess what? They went home to their churches. What do you think the next Sunday morning was like in churches all over that place where pastors were asking forgiveness of their people? And so then what was happening as a result, the word got all over the province in God's sovereignty. He put that together in such a way. Now, be, let's back up one more step. And that is we brought a man in to come and help us speak to the pastors in the morning. Reverend Cliff Dietrich from Prince George. And that's the crusade that we had just come from 
before Saskatoon. When we got there, when we talked to him about the meetings, about details in the meetings in Prince George, he was out of it. He knew nothing. Talk to my assistant, he'll tell you. Talk to my assistant, he'll tell you. Talk to my assistant. We thought, this is interesting. What's going on? And then, af as we had meetings, after, after each meeting... Oh, well, wait, hold on. Right at that point, the pastor <coughs> would sit on the platform every night with his head down, very somber, very sober. We did not know what was taking place. <coughs> very somber. And after 10 days, when he began to see what was happening in Prince George, this happened just before Saskatoon, and the, the breakthrough with people, and that's a whole nother story of, of lives, uh, some agnostics converted as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, when he began to see it, the second Thursday night of that crusade, he came to the platform as if a bird let out of the cage. And he stood up in front of the congregation and said, folks, I want to tell you what happened last night. And he said, last night in the middle of the night, when God woke me, awakened me, he said, all right, my son, I've answered your prayers. Now rejoice and relax and enjoy it. And what the congregation did not know is that for one solid year, that man did not sleep through a whole night without God waking him up to pray for revival mm -hmm. for his city and for the country. One solid year that God would use him praying for revival. And that, that, that was the, what preceded Saskatoon. And so here's this man who comes to Saskatoon during our first week there to talk to these pastors. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the excitement when they're hearing of what happened in Prince George and how God used his prayer for a solid year, hmm. how they were excited about it. And that preceded the fact of what happened in so, Saskatoon. So that brings me to the truth. People say, what is revival? And I give an answer. There's many answers, but one I like is when hidden springs spring forth. There was a hidden spring in Cliff Dietrich praying like that. And it sprang forth in just a few days later in Saskatoon. But Lou, if you're talking about hidden springs, you might start to mention a few. Oh. Here's, a, here's a lady in Vernon, British Columbia. We were there for one week of evangelistic meetings. And we had a wonderful time. We left. And here's the lady who said, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for your ministry. Well, we didn't know what you meant by that. But for four solid years, she was praying every day that God would transform our ministry from merely an evangelistic ministry to the outside world, to a ministry of revival to the inner life of the church. So when it happened, a few weeks, a few months later, we had a revival roundup in the city of Regina, Saskatchewan. And here this lady and her husband come from Vernon, B.C., over the Canadian Rockies. In the winter. In the winter, all wrapped up. Well, they were, they're way up in years. Oh, yeah. And so um, when Lou said, um, uh, Mrs. Follis, Mr. and Mrs. Follis, well, why, don't, why don't you come and, uh, and uh, share with us a little bit? Why did you come all over the... And I wanted to honor them because they had come so far and at their age to drive over those rocky mountains in that winter, right. everybody knew. What, and so, go ahead. And, when we, and we had about 700 people that came from those Western provinces for that weekend, in the midst of snow and cold weather, all the rest of it. So Lou calls them up to say a few words. So Lou says, um, um, Mr. and Mrs. Falls, what do you think of all this? Because she saw what was the people and everything. What do you think of all this? And she said, this is nothing. And Lou was kind of shocked. It's nothing. You know, and as a, an excited Italian, and this is nothing, <laughs> got 700 people there, this is nothing. But he could sense she was saying something more than that. Yeah. And she, he said, well, what are you saying? And she said, this is nothing but God, nothing more than God answering prayer. 
That's all. And I didn't know what that, what was she saying next? Right. She said, and that's where she told the story that for four years she had been praying for us that God would use this ministry for a revival for the inner life of the church. And we did not know that until that time. Wow. We've lost a lot of sleep over the, those prayers <laughs> through yeah. the years. Yeah, all the time spending with people in the way, yeah. hours of the morning, Man. late at night, and so on. So that's uh, some of the background. Okay. Yes. Well, that's one of the hidden springs that sprang forth. Okay. Let me give you another one. Uh, Bernard Palmer, who wrote the books, uh, the Danny Orlis series of books for boys and girls years ago. He, when he heard what was happening in Saskatoon, he came. Yeah, he, he had time, came. He saw it. A year later, he's at a, a Gideon's convention in South India. Yeah. And he's telling the story there a year later of what happened and what he saw in Saskatoon. After he got finished, two of those Gideons came running up to him. Tell us, tell us again, where did you say that happened? Where did you say that happened? And he said, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And they just bellowed, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Two years earlier, God laid on our hearts. We asked God to give us a city in Canada to pray for. And God laid the city of Saskatoon on our hearts. And here, it wasn't until a year later that they even knew what had happened. Incredible. And another one real fast, and that was quickly. Uh, one of the brothers was on an airplane flying from a foreign country home. And there was a man sitting next to him. He found out he was a missionary. And he uh, started talking about the revival. Oh, this man, he said, I have been praying for revival in that city for one year and didn't know about it till now. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Hidden Springs springing yeah. forth. Yeah. There are more we can say, but that's enough of that. So let's uh, let's talk about some of so, the sequence of, of the revival. Okay. You started out in a local church and then obviously it grew and grew and grew. So give us a little timeline here of how you move from one place to another and, and who all became involved. Okay. We, we were the, in the church for several nights the first week, and it, it, the crowd grew to the place that the, we couldn't hold the crowd anymore because the word got around us around the city. So we went from that church that would seat about 300 people to another church that would seat about 700 people. Yeah. And we were there on the first night, it was packed without our doing anything, just said we're moving to another church. And from 300, it was, we got 700. We had young people sitting all on the platform all over the place to get, get them in. Well, on that first night, the elders from another church that would seat a thousand people said, Pastor, we hear the revival is breaking out in the city. And that pastor didn't like the idea because that was the church where I met my wife years before when we were there for one week of meetings years before. And so he knew of our ministry, and now we came to the city in a different church for meetings. <laughs> you know what that's like. You know, sometimes pastors have a difficult time with that. Okay, but now his elders are saying to a pastor, a revival is breaking out. And so he scheduled his missionary convention to be at the same time. <laughs> so his people would not go running over to this church. Oh, preachers <laughs> don't do things like that, do they? <laughs> and, and so as a result of that, so, so they need a room, they need more room. And reluctantly, they agreed, uh, the pastor agreed to let him, so that we get a phone call. Uh, we understand you're full at this church. We come on over to our church. And so we go to the next night. And there we are, the church with a thousand people, it's full. <laughs> and the pastor sitting on the front row, this pastor, sitting on the front row. He's the one, the fact of the matter is, they had to cancel their missionary convention. They canceled it. They canceled. Well, the missionaries were already there. One, well, at least one was there for sure. Another uh, you talk away. about decisions that are made, human decisions that God used. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the one greatest, of where that pastor and his elders were had discernment enough to know that God was on the scene, that they would not let a, a missionary convention stand in the way and it's a denomination that praises itself 
prides itself, Missionary Convention is the epitome of everything. Yeah, yeah. We raise all of our funds to support. You know what? They didn't have a convention and they raised more money <laughs> than all the conventions they ever had <laughs> with the missionaries. Yeah, but so, so we go to this other church where this, this pastor was and he's sitting on the front row of the balcony. Yeah. And, and he was I saying, was wondering whether you're going to move away from the front row to the front row of the balcony. Yeah, it was front row of the Before balcony. Before you said the front row. All no, right, front the row balcony. Of the balcony. That's right. <laughs> he, he said, I wanted to see what, what these revived people Baptist. look like, these revived Baptists look like. Yeah. Is what he said. And so, you know, he was kind of itchy about it all. <laughs> so when the invitation was given, the front of the church was lined with people on their knees weeping before God and in his church. And going to prayer room. Yeah. Yeah. And there we are. Okay. And he's sitting up there and just watching this. And then in his own words, he said, I, I wanted to wait. I, need I knew I needed to come down myself. But I wanted to wait till they were all kneeling there so people would think that I was going down to pray with somebody else. Be a prayer <laughs> partner, yeah. Instead, God broke his heart. Yeah. And about what? About his selfishness and about his lack of love towards the other pastors in the city because he did not need them. He had the big church. He had the money people. He had the, the higher class. He did not need he could bring He could bring any speaker in from North America that he wanted. He didn't need his other brothers. But you know what? Here's another great decision. Yeah. He decided to call all the pastors and their wives to meet him the next day or the day after, as soon as yeah. he could do it, to meet in the basement of the home of one of his deacons to start at nine o'clock in the morning, I want to meet you, yes. because he wanted to ask every one of them for forgiveness. And, and that meeting went on till four o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> with pastors and pastor's wives getting right with God with each other. Yeah. Some of those pastor's wives wanted to get out of the ministry. Mm -hmm. And at four o'clock it was done. We had to close to get cleaned up and get, get ready to the, for the meeting at seven. And those pastors came to the pulpit and gave their testimony. I tell you, the revival was on. Yeah. When they see God spoke through to touching those pastors in well, such a way. You talk about the pastors and pastors. One story of that day, of that day. Yes. A young pastor and his wife were there in their first church. Very discouraged. Yeah. And the pastor's wife said, well, she was from the West Coast. She was from the, the British Columbia, from Vancouver. the water and the ocean. And she loved it all. Vancouver area and so on. Now she's in Saskatchewan in a, a small little uh, apartment and the cold winters and all the snow and all the rest of it, altogether different. She said, you know, when I was, knew I was going to be a pastor's wife, I was given a book that was titled How to Be a Pastor's Wife and Love It. And she said, after three years, I can write a book on how to be a pastor's wife and hate it. Yeah. And that day... Yeah. God broke their hearts. They were ready to get out of the ministry. Yeah. And because of seeing other pastors and wives getting right, God broke their hearts and we prayed for them and they, God mended them and they were on with the ministry for years to come. Marvelous. That's, that's a part of what happened that early time when the pastor was willing to open that church. Yes. So we were there for the rest of that week and it was too small. So then we rent a church that would seat 1,700 people. Hmm. And there we were, night after night, week after week after week. And then people would say, was this, we would got phone calls, they were coming in from all over North America, asking, is this a youth revival going on up there? Somehow it's in the spirit of uh, America. If it's a revival, it's going to be a youth revival. Yeah. They go to a camp somewhere and they come back and they're all revived and excited so far. So then yeah. we were getting... These preachers say, is this a youth revival? We say, no, no such thing. There is no gap between the older ones and the young ones. Good. We all got together on the bridge. No yeah. gap. Get together. We had older 80-year-olds praying with teenagers and teenagers <laughs> praying with 80-year-olds. Yeah. And those teenagers were sitting on the edge of their seat watching what God was doing when it wasn't in sermon, great sermons that had to be preached. Listen, Harold. It comes to mind that Saskatchewan is a tremendous Bible belt. 
in Western Canada. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Pastors have been preaching the truth of God there for years. And the Word of God was in the hearts of the people from and, and in the knowledge in the head of the people. So out of it's in a Bible belt where the Word of God was there that God could tap all they had known for all these years and all the faithfulness of those pastors through those years when they weren't seeing anything, God was sowing the seeds. They were planting the seeds that he could tap in a day of his visitation. Yeah. I've thought of that so many times. In a Bible belt, it yeah. happened. Well, and in that light, they were then open for the truths, of yeah. revival truths that was almost like truth that they had not, not grabbed a hold of. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about revival truths because uh, crucified life, uh, Sadura twins, I always think of sin, self, spirit. Yeah. So so before we tell more stories, which we want to hear, let's talk about the theology, the heart of the revival message. Mm. What were you guys preaching? I know there were testimonies, but what was the heart of the message? Okay, but basically, uh, before God had to deal with us about that, I said, you know, why, why there were so many who were no longer there in the church after they had given their hearts to the Lord? And God showed us ourselves that, and, and God used that pastor in Prince George yeah, that's it. to minister to us about that very thing. And see, we, we were, we, God began to show us that ours was that kind of a message of come and get all you can from God. Come for forgiveness of your sins. Come because you don't want to go to hell. You don't want to burn in hell. And now all these things are true. But you see, the essence of God was showing us that the essence of Christian experience is not what we get from him, but it's what, what we surrender because of what he's given to us on from the cross. And the cross needs to be the center. And falling in love with Jesus because of the cross and the work of the cross. And God began to sharpen the focus of that. And God used that pastor to say, fellas, yeah, you, you, you're okay. You're dealing with the self, the death to the self life. But that's wonderful. But you, but the the cross, the crucifixion, makes sure you move people to understand the full value of the cross, and God used that as the focal point. Then that's death. That's bring coming to the end of ourselves. In order now we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot fill a person who's all full of himself. See, and then and it's dealing with our sins. And then the surrender of all of, the, of our rights to God at the cross, death to all of that, death to all of my rights. Just like Christ, death to all of his rights when he said, no, not my will, but thine be done to his father. Let me give a practical touch to that sure. whole truth. For the years before God showed us to go in that direction in ministry, I used to take one Saturday night in every crusade that we would have and speak to the young people on answering the call of God to go into full-time service. And so many of them would say, yes, I feel God wants me into full-time service. And that was fine. But these were teenagers. So I, said, I don't know if they got there. I don't know if they, uh, uh, we don't know much about that. But you know what? After the, we started preaching this kind of message, I didn't preach anymore on call, asking people to join, go in full-time service for the Lord. But you know what we saw? we saw many more people going into the Lord's work, mm -hmm. into full-time service, than all the times I preached asking and begging people to go into full-time service. But listen, here's the difference. You know who was answering the call now? The husband and wife with two or three children, mm -hmm. the businessman, God saying, change your whole, whole approach to life. That business, get on. And, and the Bible colleges were filled mm -hmm. in Western Canada with that kind of situation where definitely, and you know what I was just thinking, and I just looked at a list that I have, Ralph and I know personally, that's just who we know, we know at least 250 people wow. that went into the Lord's service as a result of the revival, and that's just who we know, let alone the many, many, many more that went in that we never know a thing. And you know, you. You can hardly go to, in those days, you could hardly go to any town in Western Canada without finding at least one pastor in one of those churches was there as a result of God touching him in the revival. Incredible. Well, I can tell you that uh, 
a pastor wrote me a letter. I have a, a letter of a pastor who said, um, uh, it's interesting for you to know that this morning we had uh, a couple ministering to our congregation who met the Lord in the Western Canadian revival. And he said, it was interesting also to know that at night we had a different couple and they met the Lord in the revival and they didn't even know each other. Mm. And when we start talking about results of revival, I mean, th that's just the beginning of it. That's just yeah. the beginning of the, of the lives that God touched and are now in full-time service. Let me, you were saying about some of the people God touched. Here's just one of them. And how many times? But let me also say that we were finding that people were hearing the message when they were coming into Saskatoon and hearing the message and then listening to the testimonies. Some of them would be driving home. We had people driving 40 and 50 miles home and under such conviction had to come back and find <laughs> us in an afterglow because you see, the, consider the meeting was the glow, but afterglow was we got together with people who just wanted to meet in a, some room in one of the big churches and just sit in circles and let people share how God was changing their life and then say, anybody here need to meet God? If you're here, we'll put a chair in the middle here and somebody will come around and we'll pray for you. But in that setting, there was a lady who came to the afterglow that had come to the meeting that night, Harold, with the determination that if I can't find an answer to my heart need, I'm going to jump off of the bridge, which was just short distance, right? People had to come over that bridge almost to come to the church. This is my last night. And I tell you why. Because she had, she and her husband took in a lady whose husband left her and she would, they were being kind and took her in and, and, and with her child. And one thing led to another, uh, a situation arose between her and this lady's husband. And they ran off together 450 miles away. And that marriage was broken up. And this lady carried such bitterness and taught that bitterness to her children. And she was the one on all kind of pills, had been, uh, uh, was a, uh, suicidal, and every kind of pill going, that night she came, this is my last night if God can't change my life. She's sitting in this afterglow and we're sitting in a circle. And you know, the blessing of that is, Harold, that God's people minister one to another, sometimes better than we preachers, because they say we preachers, we have all the answers, biblical answers. But when you get these practical answers coming out of the pews because of people met God, and so there she was. She finally felt comfortable in that environment to cry for help. She tells this story. And, and so I say, I was leading that afterglow. I say, anybody here would like to share the lady? And one said this and one said that. And then there was a teenager. He said, I'd like to say something to her. I was raised in a home exactly like she's described. Yes. yes. And I want to tell her how it affected me. Mm -hmm. he said, you know what? Instead of my hating that situation that's broken up my, my, fam my parents, I learned to hate my mother who taught me how to hate people. Mm. She was teaching me to hate people and I turned my hatred on my mother and that's all I could take and I had to deal with that. And that's all we had to say that night. That woman said, on my knees I go, Christians around her. And I tell you, for 25 years we followed that woman and the glow of God about her woman. The situation never changed one iota. But I tell you, she was changed and her children were changed. Mm -hmm. And her testimony has gone out around the world and how many people have been changed. Oh, praise yeah. Lord. And there it happened, yeah. right there, when a teenager gave his testimony. That's God's people. In those afterglows, yes. what happened? Let's but speak, see, let's but speak. One further word about that. You see, God used the afterglow. Some would come to the meetings, hear the message, invitation would be given. They were not yet ready to respond. Yes. But taking the word that they heard to the afterglow and just sitting and listening to others share. And, uh, and then they, that atmosphere was exactly what they needed after they heard the word and were not ready to respond in the big meeting, but in the afterglow, God used it. And Harold, you know what? One lady at midnight calls the taxi cab company, 
to say, would you pick me up and take me to church? But I want to <laughs> go to church. And we were having the afterglow. It was still going on at midnight. And here comes the taxi cab driver and all the lights on in this church at midnight. He got so excited, he almost ran up the curb, almost ran into the <laughs> yeah, building. Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah that happened. I don't go to mid <laughs> take people at midnight to church. <laughs> so speak a little bit more on these afterglows. Uh, how long would they run? Just give the people some ideas about what was well, going on in the afterglows well, and it, how long. We would start to start uh, maybe 1030 or 11 at night after a service because we, we've been in the prayer room praying with people. And uh, by the time everybody got out, then we start. And th th those afterglows would go Sometimes till 12, sometimes 1, yeah. 2 o'clock, 2.30, 2, 3 o'clock in the as morning. As long as there was need. That's what yes. I told you. We lost a lot of sleep yeah. because yeah. that woman praying for us to change the ministry. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they would go on as long as there was a, a need. And there was uh, some people would have to leave and they would go, but many of them would stay. And then, of course, that, that couple that was the first one, the lady that met the Lord, they, after a number of weeks of night after night, and this included Saturday nights as well, for seven and a half weeks. Yeah. Okay, long nights. This couple, this one that met the Lord first, they decided, Irma, that Irma, Irma and Sam, Sam and Irma Dirksen, yeah. they thought, oh, you know, we're just exhausted. We, 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 we ought to stay home tonight and night just off. go to bed early for a night, take a night off. Guess what? They couldn't sleep. <laughs> what are we missing? <laughs> they get dressed up at 10 o'clock at night. They, they come. Get up, yeah. 10 or 10.30 at night, yeah. they come and join the afterglow. <laughs> so that they didn't miss any night. <laughs> yeah. Seven weeks, didn't miss a night. Eight weeks. Now, you see, when, when things like that happen, there's such an excitement that God is alive, mm -hmm. that he's meeting needs, yes. he's undertaking. Then the word got to the city. I mean, everybody, they were calling, the people were making restitution. <laughs> going, uh, store owners were calling the, the, the uh, newspaper. What's going on in the city? What's going on in the city? What's going on in the city? And uh, interesting about that, when I say what's going on in the city, there was, you, when the presence of God is alive like that, people driving through the city, there is a fugitive from the law stopping at a gas station. He's driving through the city, yeah. stopping at a gas station. And he said to the proprietor of the gas station, what's going on in this city? Is there anything unusual going on in the city? He could sense something was going on. And the man said, yes, there's something going on. And he told him where to come. And the man came to the meetings and got saved. <laughs> <laughs> and he went back and got his family, and then they came and he met the Lord and were, were transformed by the power of Praise God. Him. And then what did he do? He goes to the police department and turns himself in. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they said, hey, we've never had anything like this. Why are you doing this? He said, because in this city, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. and I have to be thoroughly right with God and right with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And they came to an agreement as to what they would do and settled, and it was on. And that happened because he sensed yeah. something was happening. Wonderful. And the in newspaper, the, the newspaper, one of the headlines was Wave of no, Morality. I'll, I'll get it. More yeah. Morality in the Wake of a Revival. Well, yeah. I, go, I was going with the pastor. I said, why don't we tell the story to the newspaper? Because, ah, this newspaper has nothing to do with our churches. No, they want our money for advertisements, but as far as anything else, that's it. And I said, well, let's just take a write up to the newspaper. So I'm with the pastor. We said, we'd like to meet the editor. <laughs> so he comes and said, we well, thought it would be interesting. Here's an article that we've kind of put together to let you know what's going on in the city. Oh, he said, you're all, you're too late. I've already written an article and it's yeah. going to be on the front page of the newspaper. Yeah. And they said, well, what is it? Here it is. Here it is. And the title is Morality in the Wake of Revival. Yes. And the whole city is reading and he's telling the stories. Oh, I said, why are you doing that? Well, I said, because we're getting phone calls here at the newspaper office. People telling us of, of people going to the stores and asking forgiveness and paying bad debts. And he said, I even checked 
with our newspaper and found out that some people had paid some debts that were 20 years old that they had not paid their bills. And here, and so he had to write this story. And by the way, he also got the word from the police department. Yeah. And I've got a statement from the police, uh, uh, the director of the police department. Nighttime crime is at an all time low yes. wow. yeah. in the city wow. during these days. Wow. See, all those things were beginning to happen. One man, one man had to drive because he'd robbed the income tax people so much, so much money that he would be in a hawk to the, U to the Canadian government for the rest of his life. And he drove 150 miles to the, to the uh, provincial Provin center to go and pay and be willing to go to jail or whatever for, hundred, for the rest of his life, if wow. necessary, to be right with God. And somebody wrote a letter to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. There's Trudeau up there now, but his <laughs> father was in office. And he said, <laughs> they said, wrote and said to him, you better open up a new uh, uh, section of your your government up there for all the conscience money yeah. that is going to come in from evangelical Christians oh. in Western Canada. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about the uh, urge for restitution, the utter hunger for a clear conscience. Uh -huh. uh, when they came under conviction of sin and mm -hmm. got right vertically with God yeah. through the blood, and mm -hmm. then recognized their crucifixion with Christ on yeah. the cross and got filled with the Holy Spirit, yeah. then talk talk a little bit about this urgency to, yeah. to clear the conscience. Yes. Well, you see, uh, it was almost like a natural result of meeting God personally, a recognition that uh, there's uh, the, anything that stands in between me and God and between me and another brother has to be dealt with if I want the, the reviving in my heart to continue. The, the lines need to be clear constantly. Not that we're perfect, but we're, but we are we are sensitive. We are sensitive to what God is saying. And by the way, who are the people that need revival the most in the church, or who are the ones that should respond first to that? It's the people that should be the closest to God themselves. They should be the first ones responding. Why? Well, illustrate it. If I have a nice white shirt on Sunday morning. And then I go home and my wife fixes uh, the right meal, spaghetti, spaghetti and, and meatballs, meatballs for a good Italian. Spaghetti and meatballs. But that sauce, you know, when you don't uh, handle it right and you, <laughs> you don't uh, get it right, uh, a speck, yeah. honey, I got a, a speck of uh, sauce. Too dirty. I can't wear this go to I, church no, tonight. It's it, dirty. It's dirty. It's dirty. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but I wear it to work the next morning yeah. and I get a few more stains on it. And then I go next where to day. work the next day, Tuesday, more. and I, uh, some more wrinkles on it and a few stains. more stains on it. And uh, Wednesday I wear it again and a few more stains, a few more wrinkles on it. And, and Thursday I better not wear it or else I couldn't have anybody be around me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'll smell so bad. But what bothered me the most? Was it all those stains Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? No. It was Sunday, that first speck. That, that was the big. See? Why? Because the rest of the shirt is clean. And that's why one speck seems big. Is big. Yes. So you see, the point is, those that are cleanest with God, who are walking closest to God, are the ones who ought to be most sensitive about everything that God is dealing with them about. And you know what? That's what happened in the revival. And that caused other people in churches to say, if those people needed to meet God, how much more do I need to meet God? Well, it started with the pastors. If those yeah. pastors right. met the Lord in such a way, and, and so that spirit of uh, repentance and restitution was, boom, right at the first. Uh, when that, you see, mm. one decision of a pastor mm. to be honest with God and do that, That's right. the world has been touched. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you see, and that includes uh, Henry Blackaby, yes. who's uh, w pretty well known among evangelical people, and how God used uh, the meetings during those days to touch his heart. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. talked about the, the prayer meetings they had before, that God was using that to cleanse his heart. But then he said, but then when the presence of God was manifest yes. during the revival meetings, that changed everything. 
and from uh, a congregation that he started with 10 people, how that grew and grew and, uh, and all the, the people that were affected through that ministry and the 38 congregations that his church was able to start and the number of young people and college students who were answering the call to full-time service that came out of that. So, Ralph, some of the things that happened, uh, Henry Blackaby was touched by God. Can but you know what, what, Ralph, we had Henry Blackaby speak at our conference, one of our conferences, and Ralph was with him in South Africa and asked him about the revival. Tell him, Ralph, yes. what he said, what the revival did to him. Well, you see, and it was in the 30-year conference, 30-year uh, anniversary of the Canadian revival, where he was speaking, and I, when he got finished, I did not feel as if he was really finished. And so I then entered, I said, Henry, let me ask you some questions. And in that interview for 50 minutes, it's worth hearing, I asked him, tell me, what did the revival mean to you specifically? And he said, if I were to put it in one statement, revival changed my whole DNA for life. Spiritual DNA my for spiritual life. spiritual DNA for life. And he talked about his family being changed and all his children now are in ministry and his marriage being changed and his whole philosophy of ministry being changed. And look how God has used him around the world. Then he wrote, then he wrote the Experiencing God yeah. series. After and that, that was written in 1998. This was in 90, 1971 where God touched his life. Mm. And all those years, God was honing him in on that very thing. And in 1998, Experiencing God came through. So we need to, let's, let's cut to, to this. Let's talk for a few moments about what would you fellas say to pastors today? in terms of revival. North America is in a very dry, spiritual state. Our culture has been lost. Uh, we're a mess. Uh, the power of God, conversions are an exception rather than a rule. Uh, the life of God in the soul of man. What would you say, uh, what, what would you, advice would you give to pastors today for a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. We'd like for both of you to address this. Okay, you can start. Well, I say, first of all, find a group of men who would pray. Bill McLeod got every Sunday school class to have a prayer meeting for revival. It went on before the revival. And then he had a special prayer meeting after the Wednesday night prayer meeting, he had a special prayer meeting for those who want to stay to pray for a revival. It became the obsession of the church. It's got to become a priority that God, there's no answer, but God has to come back to us. How does he do it? Through the power of a praying church, the power of a praying church. And God knows we have music and we have every kind of thing going. The prayer meeting in the average church has dwindled to nothing. Well, you see, now, uh, you see how we think alike? Because I was going to say about the same thing. The idea is that we think from our programming, from our planning, and we, we need programs and plans, but it needs to be given to us through the Holy Spirit, not from a denomination or a convention somewhere. God, every church is an individual in itself. But the idea of starting, even if it's a few men praying with the pastor, and let them get excited, and then let them get someone else to join them, and believe that God will bring Amen. back the prayer ministry to the church, recognizing that we cannot do it in our own strength. See? If my people, which are called by my name, shall call a prayer meeting, no, humble themselves first. See? That's dealing with humility. And then pray. That's dependency, a recognition that we can't make it in our own strength. We have to call on God and then turn from their wicked ways. Seek my face. That's intimacy. Ah, I want to see your face. You see, I want to get close to see your face. Intimacy, a relationship with God. And then turn from your wicked ways. That's purity. Deal with every known sin. And then God says, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and guess what heal their land and whatever that means whether it's a, a family whether it's a city a church or the whole country that's in god's hands but it's for us to be faithful and watch god use individuals and it will begin to spread in the life of the church and i hear on uh, august the 21st to the 25th 
some pastor from Asheville, North Carolina, is leading a prayer, calling pastors to meet in somewhere in New York for four days to pray for the nation and the situation, calling on pastors to get back to praying. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now you're talking about uh, 2021. No, right now. That's what I'm saying, right Next now. Next week. So that many people may not be able to get there by the time they hear this. But it's a good reminder that it's beginning to happen. Okay, let's talk. We only got a few moments here. Um, there's a lot of hungry-hearted people who are desperate to see a move of God. We're longing for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We're, we're longing for God to visit his people, his tabernacle. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about a political uh, save the nation campaign. I'm talking about the glory of God coming back mm -hmm. into the house of God, into the hearts and homes of us, his people. So what would you say to individuals, hungry-hearted, revival-hearted people, what encouragement would you give to, to those of us who long to see God okay. come again? Well, the, the first thing is a reminder that God is sovereign. And uh, the prayers that we pray now, some of them may not even be answered in our lifetime. So we are sowing the seeds. You see, we, we are to be faithful to God, see? We are not to have a, a, a spirit of unbelief, even in relation to revival. See, that's sin. We, we need to believe that God will do whatever he says he will do in the word. And whether it comes in our lifetime or not. And, and the, the point is, just keep on being refreshed. Just not being weary in well-doing. And if God will see fit to do it in your, your lifetime, thank him for it. And if not, thank God for the blessing that you've had walking with him at that kind of a level. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would encourage people. And then I would say for laymen, that have that kind of heart, find one or two other laymen and get a little group, apart from uh, even the church's group that's in and start in and let that spirit grow and let other people hear and then they'll join and others will join. What happened to you, Harold? You know, from a few group of men have prayed mm -hmm. and look at how many men come now mm -hmm. to intercede and pray. So mm -hmm. let's not be weary in well-doing. Mm -hmm. In due season, that in God's season, do is spelled G-O-D, God's season, we shall reap if we faint not. Faint not. Right. Yeah. God encourages us. Right. And God needs to deliver us from thinking that we can make it without him. Amen. It's good. It's good. What a, what a blessing. Ralph and Lou Cetera, thank you so much for taking your time. We're thrilled. We're honored that you would uh, mm -hmm. come and relate some of these events. How refreshing, how encouraging. And I know if you've been listening to this, your heart has been lifted uh, to believe God for a better day. Amen. Now look, it's dark outside, but the light of God is burning bright and can burn bright in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches, and in our communities. And I believe we just need to start believing God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit personally, family-wise, uh, corporately in our local churches. And boy, do we ever need the fire of God in these days. So I hope that these thoughts of what happened in the Canadian revival back in those days will translate into a hot, holy, humble hunger for an outpouring of God's Spirit in our day. Let's believe God for bigger and better things. Anything God has ever done, He can do again. Anything that God's done for anybody, He can do for you. And anything that God has done anywhere, he can do where we are. So let's believe God uh, to come and visit us in real power in these days. Every blessing on you. Thanks so much for taking time to listen. By the way, if you would like more material on Ralph and Lou and Revival, if you have questions that you'd like to get to them, you can go to our website. That's Christ Life Men. Christ life, L-I-F-E, men, M-I-N, dot org, Christ Life Ministries. Send us an email. We'll put you in touch with some more material that will stir your heart for the cause of revival. Every blessing.